Mohammed, Prince, Harnor, whoever you are. Sorry. He's going to watch the debate. Uh, does it make you feel better if I do the same thing with my sons? No. No. Like every single time I want to talk to you, call okay, so vice versa. Alright, so V of 1 is your velocity at time 1, that's 2, times 1 minus 2 is negative 1, that's negative 2, you're done, that's your velocity. Yay! Part B, a lot of you are doing product rule. Good for you. I feel like that's the hard way. So I'm going to rewrite this function as 2t to the 1 half times t minus 2 distribute before I differentiate, and then I don't have to do my product rule. Now I just have to do power rule a couple of times. 3 halves times 2 is 3t, subtract 1 from the exponent. 1 half times 2 is 1t, subtract 1 from the exponent. And then you can throw t down the stairs in that second term. And then plug 1 into here. 3 times 1 to the anything is this. 3, and 1 to the anything is 1, so that's 1 over 1, and that's something's wrong. That's 4. And so this is 2, so that's 2, so that's 2, so that's 1. Alright, so if you did the product rule, that would work, but it's more work, I think, than seeing, oh, I can distribute this out, and then avoid product rule. I just do power rule a couple of times. Just make sure you distribute correctly. Remember that 2 times 2 is 4. So you have negative velocity. That means you're moving in which direction, left or right? Left. So you're moving to the left, but in what direction are we accelerating? To the right. So we're moving left, but accelerating right. So what's happening with our speed? Slowing down. slowing down. So slowing down because velocity and acceleration are working against each other. So because velocity and acceleration have different signs. Uh, different signs. And that's all you've got to be able to say about slowing down or speeding up. If they were the same sign, say both negative or both positive, then you would be speeding up in whatever that direction is. Alright, so that's left, correct? Alright, so I'm going to move in that direction. Now towards the end, I was slowing down, which means I was accelerating that way. Well, let's say you're in a car. Okay. So you're in your car and you put it in reverse. But then as you back up, you step on the brakes and you come to a stop. While you're stepping on the brakes and coming to a stop, which direction are you accelerating? So you're moving to the left, but you're stepping on the brakes and therefore accelerating in the other direction. And if I keep accelerating that way, I don't just stop, I change direction and keep now going this way. So, go ask my brother about it. What is the positive? So, if this were positive and this were negative, then you're moving to the right and you're accelerating to the left and you'd be slowing down. And that would be more normal. So, that would be like. Think of up down instead of left right. You throw a ball in the air, which direction is it moving? Up. But what's happening to it? Gravity. gravity is pulling it down. Gravity is acceleration. Gravity accelerates you towards the ground, it's normally down. And while the ball is going up, it has positive velocity but negative acceleration because gravity is always negative acceleration. Then at some point the ball stops, changes direction, starts coming down. Now the velocity is negative, and the velocity is still negative, uh, acceleration is still negative. And so now the ball is speeding up because now velocity and acceleration are working together as the ball travels down towards the ground. 
Uh, so maybe thinking up down movement instead of left right movement helps this make more sense. Um, if you had negative acceleration, I'm sorry, positive, and this is, what was it? I think it was like this originally, right? Yeah. So, um, anybody wear a jetpack ever and fly around in a jetpack? Oh, okay, because that's that would that would really be helpful if you had like life experience. So like if you were falling while wearing your jetpack, you're going down, but you were like pushing the button to like give it gas and go, you're accelerating up while you're still falling. If you accelerate up long enough, you'll overcome your downward velocity and start going. But in the meantime, you could be falling but accelerate upwards because of the uh Jet pack thing, so you like don't smash into the ground. And it um, so, long story short, if the acceleration and velocity have the same sign, they're both plus or they're both minus, then you are speeding up in whatever that direction is that you're moving. If they have opposite signs, then you're slowing down. Get out your homework. This can go away for right now. We'll bring it back in a little bit. What do we want to see from the homework? 64. 74. Was there 74? Yeah, there was. Uh, what else? 81. It was like one of those problems we did in class two days ago with the graph. What else? Just those three? All right, Prince, what are you doing? I know, I, I saw that. So go ahead, what are you going to do? 64. All right, 64. Uh, Ryser, what are you doing? 74. And I'll put up the graph for 81 while somebody comes up and does it. Uh, somebody, Tanika, you can be somebody. So here's the graph for 81. Uh, so you have F. Starts at a height of five and goes up to a height of eight at three. Then comes back down to five times four or seven. So what are you going to make the graph for? Wait, what? Wait. Did you say you're going to make the graph for 64? Or... Say that again? Should I make the graph for 64? Yeah. Uh, on a graphing graph. So, you don't need to make the graph for 64. That's fine. Thank 
Talk to us about 64, please. Okay. Not princes. Put your phones away, put your mouths away, and listen to Prince. So I have a question. I distribute all that, and then it goes to X squared. Two X squared, two X squared minus six. And then I plug in negative Y So that is R D two. Just to make sure the authors of the book aren't lying to you yeah. about the y coordinate. So I have the y coordinate, and then I took the derivatives of the y coordinate, and I used that. That squared. That's. No, that's fine. You just swap your oh. order of terms. Sure about negative two? Oh, because we're plugging in negative two, correct? Not positive two. All right. So two squared is four times three is twelve. Minus six times two is also twelve, so it's zero. So then you have a minus two. So that's correct. You just wrote the wrong thing inside your f prime. So then you got your slope from f prime, and you got a point of tangency, which you double checked and made sure the y coordinate was correct. And what do you do with it? All right, so you put that stuff into your equation for point slope form, and you're good. Ta -da. Any follow-up questions with 64 in a row? So what would the graph look like? With the graphing calculator. Because if you read the textbook, I'll read it to you. It said, use a graphing calculator, graph the function and its tangent line at this point. So they use a graphing calculator. Yeah, but it would be a pain, so just use the graphing calculator. That's an obnoxious enough graph that you will not have to graph that by hand, except in very rare circumstances. And we'll talk about how to do that by hand at the end of Chapter 3. Um, but mostly this is a, ew, graphing calculator, what does it look like? It's not like a nice parent function where we should like know, oh, it's a parent function, so we... That we know what the parent function looks like. This is like some ugly cubic thing. This is ugh. 74 was 
Brysa, talk to us. Uh, now, how did you solve this equation and get x equals 0? Yeah. So when you multiply this denominator over to the right side, 0 kills it, and you're left with 2x equals 0, so x equals 0. Um, and remember, horizontal tangent lines, or horizontal lines in general, have 0 slope, and derivatives are slope. So take the slope of your horizontal line of 0, set that equal to your derivative, and then you can solve. Um, any follow-up questions to 74? Tanika, talk to us about this thing. Here's the graph of f and g. I forgot to give it g. And we're looking at, from number 1, when x is 1, right? Talk to us. So for A, um, we're trying to find uh, P prime of 1. So the first step you would do is uh, get P of X and assign the derivative of it. And um, I use the product rule. Uh, and then, so that's uh, the derivative of the first times the second plus the first times the derivative of the second. And then uh, I substitute in 1 for each of the, um, the yeah. X's. And, yeah, <laughs> e to the x. And then I went to the graph and uh, went to all the points. So for f prime 1, that's the slope. So if you look on the paper, it's easy to see it. But it's the slope is 1. And then so at g of 1, uh, that's 4. And then uh, f of 1, that's 6. And g of 1? Uh, g prime. Oh, g prime of 1, sorry. That's a, it's a negative slope. Oh, only one half, sorry. Yeah, so it's going down one over two. Yeah. And then uh, I'll evaluate it, and then p prime of one equals one. Yeah. So reading the graph to get your heights of the curve, that's f and g, and the slopes of the curve, that's f prime and g prime at one, and then you put that together in your product rule. Uh, part b? Yeah. Uh, for part b, we're trying to look for q prime of uh, four. So I got the equation and evaluated it using the quotient rule. And uh, then I have substitute in 4 for all the x. And uh, from there, I looked at the graph and found all the uh, points. So g of, g of 4 is at the 3. Uh, slope at f of 4 is negative 1. The f at 4 is 7. And the uh, slope at g of 4 is 0. So then uh, I substituted in, evaluated it, and it equals uh, Q prime of four is one, negative one third. All right. Uh, do you guys have any questions with any parts of eighty one? Rose. So primes and derivatives are go away. Derivatives are slopes. So f prime is the slope of f at four or at one. So you go to the curve at 4, and you say, oh, it's flat, so the slope is 0. Or you look at this and say, oh, that's you know a line, and I can find the slope of the line going through this point. And the slope of this line is it's going down 1 over 1, so the slope is negative 1. Or the slope of this line going up through x equals 1 is up 1 over 1, so the slope is 1. Or the slope of this line going through x equals 1 through the g curve is down 1 over 2 or down a half over 1, so the slope is negative a half. So derivatives are slopes, so you go to the curve at the appropriate point, and you find what's the slope at that point. And if it's a line at that point, then you just get the slope of that line. Uh, any other questions? Piemont, you had another. Same question. Anything else? All right, dice.
Uh, we got five six. and six and two. So two and five. Andres and Tanika, please hand in your homework. Two. You two, please, because you're in row five. No, you're not. Five. You guys are row four. Never mind, two. Row five. Lamia's row. Tanika's row. I don't want it. And I can turn back on. Notes back up. You guys can finish getting the notes down. Not much notes today. We're starting chapter 2.4. This is our last major shortcut for de taking derivatives. And this is called the chain rule. And there's the way in the textbook. If you don't like the Edgar method of chain rule, then you're welcome to read the textbook for yourself and make sense out of all of this stuff up top. So I'll give that to you there so you can see it. Uh, and the textbook has an explanation of that on pages 130 and 131. But I like my way better, so that's going to be what I teach you. So chain rule is for taking the derivative of a function that's got like an inner part and an outer part. So like if you have the square root not of just x, but of something complicated, like x squared plus 2. Then you need chain rule. If you have like sine of not just x, but sine of 3x minus x squared, now you got to use chain rule. Or if you have like any log function, natural log of crap inside it, you got to use your chain rule. So uh, the chain rule is really useful because most of the time, unless you're dealing with like a polynomial um, or a fraction, you have not just a square root of x, but a square root of stuff involving x. Or not just sine of x, but sine of stuff inside of it involving x. And so you need to identify, hey, what's the inside part, what's the outside part, and go from there. Yeah, uh, Lucas, could you please uh, turn those off, please? That's so much better. Thank you. And I can do that. So uh, we're going to be in chapter 2.4 for probably four days. Because I've got four homework assignments attached to chapter 2.4. Uh, so we're going to have... Homework tonight, homework tomorrow night, over the weekend, homework Monday night, homework Tuesday night, um, all dealing with chain rule, because chain rule gets pretty deep. Um, you can get things pretty complicated and have like a sine function inside of a square root, and then you have like layered chain rule, so that gets fun. Uh, but we're not going to jump into the deep end yet. So our goal today is going to be, let's be able to identify what are the inner and outer parts of the function, and then do fairly basic chain rule examples with it. And then as we go through, we'll do more of those graph type problems in context with chain rule, or more velocity, acceleration, position kind of problems, and all these other applications. But today and probably tomorrow, just trying to get the basics down. Two, can you see that okay? That's better.
Um, does anybody need more time with their notes? Okay. Well, I'll leave them up there, but we can move on. Lucas, could you turn the light back on, please? All right. So the first thing we want to do is make sure we can identify the inner part and the outer part. Because if you can't do that, then you can't do chain rule. So again, chain rule is you get the inner part, you get the outer part, you differentiate each of them separately, and then you multiply them together. So uh, sometimes identifying the inner part is fairly easy. So example 2b, what do you think is the inside part? 2x. And how could you tell? Because it's in parentheses. Like if you see parentheses, that's a giveaway. This guy's inside. So the 2x is inside your sine function. And then, what is that inside of? So what's your outer part? Sine. Now there always has to be something inside the outer part. And what I recommend is write out in terms of in. What I mean is, it's sine of the inside stuff. So we have an inner part and an outer part. Now if you, uh, I don't know how my brother teaches this. I imagine he's had to teach you guys chain rule as well. Okay. Uh, okay. But you have to memorize. So instead of like, well, you guys just memorize these formulas, basically. So you don't have to actually know the chain. So now, now you know how to derive the Just in time for your AP test. Okay. So once you've identified your inner part and your outer part, then you can differentiate each piece. So what's the derivative of 2x? 2. So we type dn equals 2. What's the derivative of sine? Cosine. So cosine of inside stuff. And then you take these guys, d in and d out, and you multiply. So you have to identify the inner part so that you can then differentiate it. You have to identify what is that stuff inside of, what's the outer part, so you can differentiate it. And then you multiply the d in and the d out. So you have two times cosine of the inner part, and then what you got to remember at the end is, wait, 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 it's not really about in, it's about x, so what was in a stand-in for again? 2x, oh yeah, okay, convert this back into being 2x, and that's your y prime, so that's kind of the, the general idea. So, instead of like maybe going through all of these, we'll just like in detail where we actually get the derivative, we'll focus now on just identifying, okay, what's the inner part and the outer part, uh, but you've seen the whole process once to kind of see what, what we're doing with this. Right, sir? Yeah. So d out is the derivative of the outer function, and the inside stuff there will stay the same. So you have inner stuff staying the same inside the derivative of the outer part. On the outside, you have the derivative of the inside part. So for the first couple days at least, you're going to want to write down explicitly what's in and what's out. As you do this more and you get a greater comfort level with this, you'll get to the point where you don't have to write down explicitly in and out, and that kind of happens in your head, and then you just go to the derivative. Um, but for right now, I want you guys writing down, hey, what's the inside part, what's the outside part, get in that habit so it's really clear. And that way, if you're making mistakes, it's more easy to identify where the mistake is as well and correct it. All right, the other easier one up here is C. So for C, what is the inside part? So inner part is what? 3x squared minus x plus 1. How can you tell that's the inner part? It's inside a square root. All right, okay, cool. That's, that's helpful. So trig functions and square root functions and other radical functions are really nice. The inside part is really clear because it's inside the square root or it's inside the trig function. Um, what's happening to that inside stuff? It's getting square rooted, so the out is the square root of that inside stuff. Now, when you go to do your derivative, 
you don't really like square roots, so you would have to then rewrite this square root of n and say, actually, that's n raised to what power? One half. And then we don't have space there, so we're not, I'm not going to do it. But we'll get to examples like that, if not today, then tomorrow for sure. Uh, but at this point, you would do the derivative of the inside part, 6x minus 1. The derivative of the outside part, so just use your power rule, and then you multiply those two things together. All right, number D is you know, a little sneaky. What's the inside part? So you might think, oh, the inside part is x, because it's inside what? Canyon squared. So yeah, inside could be x. Um, but then what's the derivative of tan squared? We don't know that, right? We know the derivative of tangent, but not necessarily tangent squared. So when you have a trig function raised to a power, that is weird, and it's not helped by the notation that we use or we do. But let's just change the notation. We have tangent getting squared of x. What that really means is you have the tangent of x. That's getting squared. And rewriting a trig function to a power in this way with brackets around the entire trig function of whatever is in there, and then move the exponent out here past the brackets, I think that makes it a little more clear what's actually going on. So when we say tan squared of x, you're plugging x into the tangent function, you get an answer from that, and then you square it. I don't know why this is the conventional notation for this, but it is, so we have to get used to it. But this is what it really means. So this is a, a situation where uh, mathematicians being lazy and making like shortcut for notation so they don't have to write the brackets kind of hides the ball in terms of what's really going on. So this is really what's happening with this function, and that makes it more clear what's in and what's out. So now, what's inside tangent x, and that helps that you now have brackets around the tan x. So you can say, oh, tangent x is inside brackets, that helps. And then what's happening to the tangent x? It's getting squared, so you have inside squared. Let's go ahead and do it. So, what is the derivative of tangent? Secret squared x. And what is the derivative of something squared? Two times the inside, two times the something. So then you would multiply those two things together. Say y prime equals secant squared x times 2 and what's in really tangent x. And then maybe that looks awkward to you to have the two in the middle between your two trig functions. So how could we rewrite this and make it look a little bit less awkward? Okay, you can put the two out front. So these three things are just getting multiplied together. The order of multiplication doesn't matter. You normally put the coefficient out front. So if you stop here, you're not wrong. You're just an awkward person. And I guess there's nothing morally wrong with being awkward. Uh, but normally we'll write the two out front. Um, any questions with D? Last one, I think A is the least obvious. First of all, you might look at A and say, well, I got this chain rule stuff. I'm just going to use what other rule? Quotient rule. And you'd be like, totally reasonable to just do quotient rule with that for sure. But since we're looking at chain rule right now, let's think about what could be the inner part. And like, what's really the only option we have to be the inside part? Like, what else could it be? Like, one? It's really only two options. You could say inside, I don't know what it is, but it's either 1 or it's x plus 1, because honestly, what else could it be? So let's say it's x plus 1. What's happening with the inside stuff? It's dividing 1. Now, that's not particularly helpful, but kind of like the square root situation, if we want to differentiate this, how would we have to rewrite it first? into the negative first power. So then you're like, oh, it's just into the negative power. Okay, now I can just do power rule on that. 
And meanwhile, the derivative of the inside is just going to be 1. So we'd have d in equals 1, and d out due to power rule on that thing. So that's identifying inside and outside parts. That's, for right now, like the most important thing uh, in being able to be chambered, because if you can't identify in and out, then everything else is kind of a moot point anyway. Um, before we get into doing example three, what do we have here? 45? All right, we'll definitely have time for example three and example four, and we might do it for example five today. If not, there's always tomorrow. Um, before we do that, do you guys have any follow-up questions or any clarification points? Yes, Ryan. Okay. Yeah. Uh, because what else would there be? Yeah, because the other option is one. And then you would have in equals one and out equals in divided by x plus one. And if anything, that's made things worse. So so if you're not if it's not clear, like I don't know, like the fraction is weird. Right, let's make a guess. Alright, let's let's guess that in equals one. Okay, if in equals one, then what does out have to be? Oh, that's worse. All right, let's try the other option, because there's really only the two options. Um, in general, when you are dealing with a fraction, uh, sort of function like A, the denominator will be your N if you're going to go a chain rule route. Um, and that really is only going to work if the numerator is a whole number. So if the numerator is a whole number, or just not necessarily a whole number, just a number. The, whole, uh, the numerator is a constant. That's the word I want. And you have a fraction. You can do chain rule with in equal to the denominator and out equal constant over the denominator. Um, if the numerator is not a constant, then you're stuck doing both of them. Right, sir? So. Uh, if it were x plus 1 over 2, then I would break that into like x over 2 plus 1 over 2. And differentiating something separately. That's what we don't have to do. But you could probably do it that way. Um, and it would work, it would just make an extra number for itself. So there is such a thing as like overdoing chain rule and applying chain rule where you don't really need to. Like I wouldn't do chain rule here, I would probably do super close. But this was just to kind of see how chain rule works. Because if you have like x plus 1 to the fifth down there, you don't want to do quotient rule on that. You would much rather do chain rule at that point. Because in order to do quotient rule, if this is raised like the fifth power, you got to do out x plus 1 to the fifth power and distribute that out. And we've got time for that. So uh, that's why we're doing this example here. You okay, Neuros? All right. One example, us together. Next example, you on your own. So this one, all of us together. We have some stuff getting cubed, but it's not just x cubed, so we can't just do power rule directly. We've got to chain rule this thing. So we're chain ruling it. We've got to identify the inner part and the outer part. Who's the inner part? x squared plus 1. And for the outer part, what's happening to it? Getting cubed. So the inner part cubed is your out. So you write down your function. You identify ins and outs. And then you differentiate each piece. So what's d in? 2x. Like, hey, 2x, box that. And then over here, you get d out. And you're doing d out initially in terms of the inner part. So d out equals 3 times the inner part squared. And then maybe it's helpful at this step right now, before you put things back together, to replace in with what it really is. So, say n is really what? x squared plus 1. So instead of 3 times n squared, we can say this is 3 times the quantity x plus 1 squared. Once you've got your d out and your d in separately, you put them back together by doing what with them? Multiplying, because chain rule is just d in times d out. So then you got 
2x times, see now all this stuff on the outside can multiply. So when you multiply these back together, what's the stuff on the outside of the parentheses? 6x. So you say 2x times 3 is 6x, cool, and then times x squared plus 1 squared. Ta da And you're done. Any comments to follow that up or questions, clarifications, queries, concerns? Should you distribute if you're really bored and you have nothing better to do with your time? You go ahead. I would recommend you not because that's just one more opportunity to make a mistake and for what? Zeros? Oh, yeah. Like, are we going to get to the point where, like, find the equation of the tangent line at x equals 7? And then you got to plug in 7, you get the slope, plug in 7 here, you're y, all that stuff. Or this is the velocity equation. Tell me the XR. Yeah, we're, we're going to get there. So the first day with a new rule is, let's get to know the rule. Sometimes the second day with a new rule is, you know what? One day wasn't enough. Let's continue to get to know this guy before we uh, take him out of the day to like more bad analogies. Uh, we have to do something a little bit by the game. Now, I told you it was bad now. I'm good at this. I'm good at bad now. All right, you guys try example the next one. I can call it four. Um, so very similar to example three. See, hey, what's the uh, inside part, outside part? Differentiate each of them. See how you do with it when you uh, are on your own. I would probably do not, I would just do that. But again, it's just a matter of preference. It's not the most difficult thing to do. But let's see what happens. Let's see what happens. Let's see what happens. Let's see what happens. Just make sure you have parentheses around that background front because the whole thing is multiplying the other part, not just the top X. Also, I would say D minus D squared is not just one squared. Oh. So, it's little details that you can do this. Now, if you're going to distribute this three, instead of distributing it backwards to this stuff, it's not totally clear. It's going to be X minus D plus three to the X. Instead of three to here, or if you don't need to distribute it all, just have three to the second here. That's cool. Oh, so if you're distributing this three to here, it won't also distribute it. Don't distribute it here, actually, because the x value is 1 plus 7 is 1 plus 3. So it 
this your x minus two x squared squared is just gonna be All right, let's go over this. So you have your in was three x minus two x squared, and your out was your inner part cubed. I think everybody I saw got that stuff down just fine. And then everybody I saw differentiated these just fine. So you have 3 minus 4x for a d in. And then d out is 3 times the inside squared. And then the inside is really just a stand-in for 3x minus 2x squared. Now, see that exponent? Don't forget him. Now, at this point, you've got to multiply these together. And there's been some questions about, like, what gets distributed? Nothing has to get distributed. You can just kind of take these three factors and sit them next to each other and not distribute out anything. But if you are going to distribute this three, distribute it to the d in, not here because of the exponent. So I would say f prime of x equals 3 times 3 minus 4x times 3x minus 2x squared squared. And I would just leave that be. But if you want to distribute, you can distribute that like so and call it a day. Just make sure this 9 minus 12x is also in parentheses because this whole thing is multiplying the other factor, not just the 12x. So either of those would be totally fine. If you wanted to distribute out the rest of the way, why? That's just so much work because you got to do this whole thing squared and then distribute the 9 minus 12x. Don't do that. So leave it in factored form and just put the coefficient factor way out front or distribute that through just the linear factor but not the uh, squared factor. Um, we'll come back to this with more tomorrow on example 5 and following. You have homework tonight. Good luck with it. We'll go over questions.